All right, here with Amber Balkin. I want to start, we were just talking about Bush. Um, obviously, we became aware of you, uh, a lot more aware of you when the Accelerate Her program was launched with Bush. Really cool thing. Um, do you mind walking us through kind of how that happened and kind of what the goal is with that program in, in racing? Yeah, for sure. So I think it was about, mm, I want to say January or so, I had a gentleman reach out to me and he was like, hey, uh, I'm with Bushlight. I'm, I'm not with Bushlight, but I represent them. And uh, I want to talk to you about getting in contact with them to do something with you. And usually <laughs> when people reach out to me for sponsorship, half the time I'm like, I don't Archive. believe them always right away. <laughs> <laughs> and then once the conversations got going, I was like, oh, wow, this really is Bush Light. So um, yeah, it was really neat. We did a cool commercial for the Daytona 500 and uh, announced the Accelerate Her program, which is a program to help females move up the NASCAR ranks. So um, they said they've committed to X amount of dollars for us. So I'm, I'm hoping to see where, uh, looking forward to seeing where that goes with them. Nice. When you talk about moving up the NASCAR ranks, like I'm pretty new to just the sport in general um, and, and Steve as well. What does that kind of process look like almost from you just like start racing as a kid, like go-karts and then kind of how does the kind of climbing the ladder into like the cup series sort of work? If you don't mind kind of explaining that, because yeah. I'm not even sure. <laughs> the journey honestly looks very different for everybody. Uh, for me personally, I grew up dirt track racing, racing uh, go-karts and then sprint cars. Some people start in pavement um, go-karts and then legends and then stock cars. So it's really different for everyone. But I transitioned over to the pavement side when I was, I think, 22 and um, started in late model, limited late models, which is late, like a late model stock car on pavement. And then now I race in NASCAR's National Arc Menard Series. So there's four national series of NASCAR. There's the NASCAR Cup Series, which is the top series. Right underneath that, you have NASCAR Xfinity Series, NASCAR Truck Series, and NASCAR ARCA Series. And then underneath ARCA, we have ARCA East and ARCA West, uh, which are more of the regional ARCA series. So, uh, and then underneath that, there's a million different types of late models, stock cars uh, that you can all kind of get your feet wet in to help you get up to the ARCA series. So it mainly requires financial backing. Obviously talent is involved as well, but uh, it doesn't matter how talented you are. If you don't have the financial backing to help you move up the ranks, um, then you're not able to move up. So that's definitely the most challenging part of our sport for someone like me who doesn't come from a big financial backing. Uh, basically at 10 years old, my dad said, all right, you can race, but you have to finance everything on your own and also work on the cars. So I've been raising my own sponsorship yeah. for the last 20 years, which has been made it really challenging, but also really rewarding because when I am able to talk to these corporate companies and um, sign these big sponsorships to know that, you know, that was my hard work that I put in to create that relationship. It makes it a lot more exciting rather than, you know, just having your dad write a million dollar check to a, to a <laughs> team. So, um, and, you know, it's allowed me to cultivate business skills and marketing skills and all these other skills that, you know, the, other drivers that I compete against may not have because they not have not had to do it this way. Um, so I, I like to always look at it as a positive thing, even though at times it definitely yeah, feels right. like a positive, but uh, it makes it that much more rewarding when I do get to partner with people like Bushlight and, and these, these big companies that are a part of NASCAR. Is there a lot of uh, daddies writing big checks in NASCAR for yeah, I would say at <laughs> like say. this level, truck level, um, even Xfinity, it's I would say more than ninety percent. Oh wow, yeah. wow, yeah, that's, that's wild. <laughs> isn't it so much more enjoyable? Like neither Wes or I came don't for come money, for money, so it's <laughs> isn't it so much more enjoyable? Like the grind, like in doing it and doing it, and then like when the good things start happening, it's like you know it's not because you got a check just for doing nothing. For um, sure it feels it feels good so that I think that was a good call by your dad and just getting into it though too it's like were you ever kind of discouraged if you if you were around people that were getting kind of you know the checks handed to them and you were like oh. well I'm on a different path Absolutely. The, for most of my career is extremely discouraged because not only do 
does the financial backing get you to the next level? But financial backing gets you more test days. You know, it can be 10, 20 plus thousand dollars for us just to get a test day where in a stick and ball sport like baseball or hockey, like you, you, you go on the field, you throw a ball and that's how you practice. Yeah. Where in racing, you need to spend thousands and thousands of dollars right. to get the tires, fuel, people, equipment, everything to the track. You got to rent the track. And it's even that in itself, you know, if you have the money, it's such a leg up on your competition because you're getting, they're getting to practice when others aren't. So most of my career, I felt very behind the eight ball because not only was I getting those was I not getting those extra practice sessions, but I also wasn't racing as often there between 2015 and 2020, I was only racing a handful of races per year. Well, it's really hard to develop your skills and get to the next level if you're not constantly in the seat. So um, I've definitely struggled with that. But as I've gotten older, you know, you really work on your mindset and, and try to just look at the positives and, and try to figure out how to turn your weaknesses into opportunities. So that's what I've had to do. And it's cultivated a lot of mental toughness in me, that's for sure. But I think that also can apply to racing. Yeah. Looking at like your social media, I get this like work hard, like no excuses, kick ass type of vibe. And I can definitely kind of see where that comes from. Um, we also saw this these uh videos on your instagram of you working out and like doing some like crazy hand coordination <laughs> skills and the just, like, tech, probably like yeah. neck <laughs> workouts and it's like what is like fitness for like a race car driver look like because i've seen like when the cup series is racing and they put like the heart rate monitor on the guys and it's like 140 beats a minute and then it's like oh they've just ran a marathon and like you know it's like I think people don't necessarily quite give it the credit for being a physical endurance type of sport. Um, so kind of what is the physical regimen of, of a driver kind of look like? Yeah. So me personally, I work with a driver specific trainer. So he works with people from my level all the way to the NASCAR cup series. And um, it's a lot of, it's a combination of like resistance training, strength training, um, cardio, and then neck training, which is kind of one of the odd things because we, when we're in the cars, we have to fight the G-forces. And a lot of that is on our neck. We're wearing helmets on top. And then um, in addition to that, like heat training, because it's about 140 degrees in those cars sometimes. And to be able to physically putting stress and dealing with the G-forces for two, three hours per race. And then on top of that, you're in, you know, a triple layer fireproof suit with a helmet and bell clava and gloves in 140 degrees on top of that so it's very very demanding on your body how i like to best explain it was when i'm finished a race it feels like i just ran like 100 miles and the next day i often feel hung over not because i had some beers the night before but because like your body is just so depleted and um dehydrated and exhausted from putting it through all of that in the race. So um, the argument of if drivers are athletes or not, 100% we are athletes. I lose five pounds a race um, just from sweating so much. And uh, I train hard throughout the week. You know, I add in sauna sessions on top of all the physical training. And then what you were um, speaking of earlier was the synapse tech. So we do a lot of uh, reaction time, sensory work, cognitive skills uh, to develop our, you know, reaction time, peripheral vision, uh, a lot of different like vision type of I like to call them games but it's <laughs> programs yeah. of training but like it kind of looks like a game so uh, that's incorporated every day into my training as well I literally had a note in here <clears throat> you brought up a, a hangover when you're talking about sports it's like there's certain sports I feel like you can get away with playing hungover and maybe sometimes when an athlete's like if they had a great game and they were sick it's like maybe they were actually hungover partying the night before <laughs> yeah but like for football, for example, if you're hungover, you get maybe get an IV in the before the game, drink some Gatorade. As soon as you get hit once, you probably forget you have a hangover, right? You have to. Um, but you you mentioned the heat, the clothes, the I can't imagine having to drive a car like that hungover, <laughs> right? It's like that has to be. Like, I don't know if you've ever even practiced hungover, but that sounds like it'd be an absolute disaster. No, I don't <laughs> do hangovers 
as a, on a normal day so i can <laughs> right. never show up like i won't even have one Sounds like torture yeah. before race but there are drivers who will drive hungover and, and they're fine so i think that it's <laughs> a preference i guess but i think it'd be better not to drive hungover because being hydrated is extremely important um even after my kansas race it was my first long hot race of the season and i was absolutely whipped after i on our plane ride home i was puking on the plane ride home i was puking on on the drive oh, home, I was worse. shaking, I had a headache, I was nauseous, dizzy, like every type of, of feeling and like fell asleep as soon as I got home. So um, that just made me know that I need to up my hydration even more. So not even just drinking water, but we drink Pedialyte. So I drink Pedialyte throughout the week, a lot the day before and the day after, which some people know also kind of helps the hangovers. Yeah. Um, Very and familiar. Then, <laughs> yeah. And then like, for salt like I drink pickle juice sometimes I know that might sound gross to some but I, I love that like it <laughs> um so like pickle juice for the sodium the electrolytes obviously just plain water as well and then making sure I get my meals and that's a big thing too because I'm a small girl so I need to make sure the carbs the protein everything's all there so that my body body can run off of it for the race if, if my wife ever complains about flying hungover again, I'm going to be like, quit acting like you're a NASCAR driver. <laughs> <laughs> and like, you just came back from a race. Um, something that we, we also noticed and speaking of my wife, like back in the day, she would kind of not force me, but I would watch like the bachelor with her the bachelorette. Mm -hmm. I didn't watch it cause I really like enjoyed it, but it, I liked getting angry. It was enjoyable <laughs> getting angry. Yeah. You were on, I think it was on CMT, the Racing Wives. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken. Was that experience just like horrible, or was it kind of fun, or because everybody I know that's ever been on reality TV, like they're like it's nothing like what you see. They're all manipulative. I I was almost on Master Chef, the cooking <laughs> show, so I even saw that like how crazy it is behind the scenes and how almost like producers. Yeah, the it's just like a, the, it's just it's it's nuts, right? Um, what was that experience like to be on a show like that? Yeah, so when the opportunity came about, I was really excited because I was at a point in my career where I couldn't find sponsorship. And I thought that by have, being on you know, a national TV show with other NASCAR drivers wives, it would help me get the exposure I needed to get sponsors. And also at that time, I'm a Canadian here on a visa living in the US. I'm not able to work outside of racing so i'm a broke struggling race car driver right. and i have you know hey we have exposure and money the two things that you need right now so it was easy for me to say yes let's do this show um at times it was super fun and it was awesome and i'm like i got to experience so many things that i would have never got to experience otherwise um but it, there were also moments that were very stressful and there were times that you felt very manipulated and um when it comes to editing it that the editors can make a situation look very mm -hmm. different than it actually was and so be and then after watching on tv and be like wow now this is what everyone thinks of me even though that that's Ooh. really not what the truth is that part was tough um but also helped me gain a lot of thicker skin which i think i needed um to be a professional athlete to be in nascar you need to have thick skin and i needed to gain that to to get here so um all in all really happy i did the show there was definitely some times that i questioned it um just because there you know there's a lot to deal with and then obviously you have all these people talking about you in a negative way when they're talking about things that didn't really happen or weren't really true um so it's a great time to you know be be comfortable with yourself and learn yourself and not, not learn to not care what others think being a driver were you kind of more separate from the wives storyline or were you like all kind of together like with each other yeah i was definitely different um obviously i'm a driver but i'm also a female so like i don't always fit in with the drivers and then i'm a female but I'm not, a, I wasn't a wife at the time. I was a driver. So I didn't really yeah. fit in with the wives either. So I'm like kind of in this weird in between limbo stage. Um, so as far as storylines, I couldn't really relate to the, the wives because I was the driver. So um, I was intertwined, of course, with them. How, how I got involved in the show, because a lot of people were like, well, you're not a wife. Why are you in the yeah. show? Um, was I raced for Samantha Bush's husband Kyle and um that's kind of what my place was and they had another girl at the beginning who ended up dropping out and they kind of needed to fill that place 
And um, instead of just adding another wife, they Samantha introduced CMT to me. They ended up liking me, and and that's how I became a part of the show. You mentioned Canada. <clears throat> we have a, a great writer um, who does a lot of outdoors writing for us. Who's from Canada, lives in Canada. Um, obviously, we have we have another friend that we knew from a, our, our office um, from Canada. Love Canadians, love Canada. What's your favorite part of the country? And where, which part of the country has the best food? Because I visited, to me, Montreal. I haven't visited a lot of places, but I love Montreal for the food. Do you have a favorite spot to go to? Maybe where you, you're not necessarily from when you go uh, back? You know what? I've been to most states, but I haven't been to most provinces <laughs> okay. because of racing, of course. But um, I'm from Winnipeg, and I just I miss the people the most and the food. Like I think our food is unreal. Like every restaurant you go to is delicious and so I definitely miss the food um as far as other than Winnipeg I don't really know if I have a favorite I think British Columbia is beautiful um where's Jacob from Wes our writers named Jacob. he's from um, like Newfoundland <laughs> yeah, basically yeah, like he's like almost he's almost in Iceland <laughs> yeah I have not been out I haven't been yeah. to the east coast of Canada yet that's that's still on the list his, his accent is like you times 10 like it's, <laughs> is it a lot of like go yes, to the car in yeah. your car like he says yeah, <laughs> y-a-s for I think he's trying to say you guys I think oh, is like yeah. the translation when he says yeah yes yeah, was, yeah. <laughs> um nice, it also, nice people yeah <laughs> um, you're also the first Canadian woman to win a NASCAR sh- sanctioned race. Um, so when you see a guy like Danny Suarez, who's from Mexico, win a cup series race last weekend, first driver from Mexico, only fifth, I believe, uh, non-American born driver to ever win a cup series race. Is that a super like inspiring moment for you to just get like, I mean, I feel like everyone kind of roots for Danny Suarez, yeah. but like how Jack do you get watching him? you know, take home a checkered flag on, on a, in a cup series race. Yeah, no, that was amazing. Honestly, I found it so inspirational and, um, I like, it's hard for me not to get emotional when I see like first time winners. Cause you put yourself in that situation. You're like, and you're like feeling what they're feeling because I visualize all the time me winning. Like that's always the goal is to win races and to see people that kind of come in, come from, you know, different places or might have some similarities to you for, to see them successful kind of re gives you hope that, all right, if they can do this, I can do this too. And, um, that's a big part of why I want to be successful and I want to win races because I want to show the people that don't come from money and maybe are Canadian or female or so different. Like I am to be like, wow, if Amber can do this, then I can do that too, because there is this, you know, notion that in order to be an NASCAR driver, you need to have a famous last name. You need to come from money. You need to be, you know, a white American man from the South. And um, <laughs> it's, you know, having people like Daniel Suarez win and, and kind of break some of those stereotypes. I really want to break those stereotypes of ob- obviously female Canadian. And, um, but the biggest one, like I said before, is the financial backing, just knowing that you can get there without the, the mm-hmm. famous last name and the money. I feel like when I was younger, I, and I, I don't remember the year, but when like Danica Patrick became like really big as a younger guy, I remember like it was the push was like, okay, the sport, but it was more like, hey, look, she's pretty. Like, hey, look, this is like rare for this to happen. So it was like, it almost felt like that was the narrative a little bit, right? Which is obviously like unfair because you want to focus on the sport. Mm-hmm. Has that gotten better, you think? Like, or maybe I'm wrong. I was just like a younger guy. And that's how I felt like they were kind of trying to portray it. Um, because we see that in country music too. A lot of times it's like, there's a very different, uh, uh, like the way guys are treated or, or pushed out there and the way women are, are like completely different. We've talked a lot about this a lot on the podcast. So how is that in NASCAR? Is it, is it, is it pretty, pretty, do you feel like it's pretty fair now? Or do you feel like they still try to tend to go like, well, we can mark you this way? Like, no, I think it's gotten a lot better. Actually, I think they're almost doing the opposite. I think they want females to be a little bit more conservative and, and not push sex, sex sales kind of thing anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, they no, they, they know that we're drivers and they want to, they want to treat us like drivers. It's just, I think the biggest thing is um, as a female finding people who can look at you the same as any other driver. Mm -hmm. That's personally 
for me, you know, I spoke to a lot of different teams before I chose one this year to race with. And that was at like the top of my list. Like, do they believe in me as a driver? Are they going to treat me the same as they would a man? Um, do they see me as an equal and, and know that I want them to know how hard I work to get here to kind of earn their respect as well. So, um, there of course are challenges in being female, but at the same time, like I've only ever been a female in racing, so I don't know any different. Um, but yeah, I think when people realize how hard I've worked to get here and how much work I've put in during the week to prepare for these races, that's kind of when the respect starts to come. Yeah, absolutely. And I also feel like NASCAR is the type of situation where the results on the track are going to have to do the talking. It's not like, oh, she's only here because she's a female and they want to have more females in NASCAR. It's like, yeah, if you and can't race well, and I think, what are you fifth right now in the ARCA series standings? Like yeah. results speak for themselves, you know? Yeah. And I think, you know, you, you definitely still get that um, no matter if you're good or not, yeah. just people like, like to talk, but um, that's when I really try to just focus on in my own little bubble and do what I need to do to try to make those results the best they can be. We were, before you got on, we were joking about like, do drivers change their own oil? Like if, if you <laughs> found out somebody, somebody's a professional driver and they're at home and they take their car and they get the oil, like, or do, do all you kind of, oh, I feel obligated to like work on my own car at home. What, is that or is that completely separate you're like whatever I think I think that's different for everybody um like when I was in dirt I worked on all my own race cars so I was used to working on cars now in NASCAR you have a whole team that does that for you you got to focus on driving because that's that's your job um so to be honest no I don't change my own oil the, the and I change my own oil okay. yes but do I no I, okay, I think yeah. it's a dealership <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it's easier right but I also live in an Would apartment you, I don't have like a proper shop yeah. and all that kind of and stuff you, but did you go your dad seems like the type maybe in a good way where did you get yelled at if you held the flashlight wrong that famous <laughs> thing about <laughs> No, my, my dad wasn't much of a yeller, which is good. He was very hard on me. He wanted me to, you know, work hard and, and do, do stuff right for sure. But he wasn't, wasn't much of a yeller. He, his thing was just like, be in the garage with me every single night. I don't mm. care if you're holding flashlight wrong. Yeah. Just just watch. Yeah. 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 Speaking of family, you're married to a Canadian football player. And then your brother-in-law is on the New York Rangers. Um, what's it like being in a competitive professional athlete family? Are you guys like you tease each other a bit or is, is it more competitive or is it more love? Also, Ryan Reeves, is he a scary dude? Cause he's a scary <laughs> dude on the ice. Um, he's like, I think everyone that first meets him is super intimidated by him. <laughs> he's a very like intimidating guy, but like I've been with Jordan for almost five years now. So obviously like, I don't see Ryan like that anymore. He's, yeah. he's my brother. So, um, I love him to death, just like I love Jordan to death. And no, it, I think it's all love between all of us. Like we're all super supportive of each other. And, um, I don't think there's much of a like competitive aspect. Like we're all just super pumped on what each of us are doing. And we try to, you know, kind of be each other's cheerleaders when we can. And, um, personally as as a wife now like having my husband be a professional athlete and be able to talk to him and him understand everything that I'm saying and vice versa you know like he's dealt with a lot of injuries and he's been through a lot in his career and for him to be able to talk to me and I fully understand every emotion and everything that he's going through I think that is huge like just to have your partner be so understanding of what each other is going through and you know, Jordan always knows how to say the right, knows exactly what to say when, when I'm, whether it's, you know, talking about a bad race or a good race or having hard conversations that I need to have with my crew about certain things. Like he, he gets it. And that's, that's such a good feeling for me. And it just makes my life easier. Good job by him. Actually, I was even thinking about that when you were talking earlier about like the, the dads, like signing checks and stuff, whether it's um, football or, I mean, there's so many stories in like the Dominican Republic with baseball. It's like a milk jug. They cut the top off. That's their mitt. The stick <laughs> is for the, you know, and then literally the next thing you know, they're, they're Sammy Sosa or, or in football. It's like 
college football, you're really good. Okay. You're a millionaire now. You know, yeah. it's like, you can, you can kind of get by. It's like, I feel like the journey is like, it's so much more complex for, for drivers. It's, it's pretty wild. I don't, I don't think that average person, even if it's me who watches, but then like just enjoys gambling on it, to be honest. <laughs> so you don't think about it. You're just like, yeah. Oh, drive. And I actually think, don't you think it's a misconception? Cause I've noticed this with people that don't know anything about it. Like that look, you just drive in a circle right? That yeah. has to drive you crazy. Somebody who doesn't know anything about it. It does. I mean, the amount of preparation that we put into these races as drivers, as crew chiefs, as engineers is way more insane than anyone could ever like fathom. Like it's so much preparation. And I think another big misconception is the guy in first is the best driver and the guy's last is the worst driver. That That's not always the case. The, these cars that we're in, they determine how good we're going to be. Uh, you have to have a good, you can be a great race car driver in a crappy car and you're not going to do well. You need to have a great race car and a great driver to be successful. And um, a lot of times you can have a good car, but maybe the setup isn't right. So you need to be able to communicate to your crew chief what the car is doing so they can make the proper adjustments to make your car better so you can be faster. So there's tracks we go to where like, all right, we're fifth place car today, or all right, we're 10th place car today, or we're a third place car. And then me as a driver, I gotta make sure I'm getting all uh, out of that car as I can. So it's not just the driver when it comes to success and results, it's also the car. And that's why you see, you know, the big teams in NASCAR, why they're always winning because they have the best cars. And of course they have great drivers to go along with it. You well, then, just, oh, I was gonna say in the was. crew too, because like I, I mean, even recently in some of the Cup Series races, like a crew can like cost you a race if there's a mistake yeah. or a wheel falls off, or yeah. which is happening on quite a few times this year um, with the new setup and stuff. Um, which is unfortunate because it's like kind of a team sport, even though you you know you think of NASCAR as like a racing in general is like oh that's one guy in a car, one girl in a car, like. Right. No, there's a crew and there's a crew chief and there's a team of mechanics and engineers and it really exactly. takes like a whole village to, you know, win, win a race. And For sure. And I always kind of relate it to football since that, you know, that's what my yeah. husband does. And, you know, the driver is essentially the quarterback. Like, yeah. they, they're a very mm. main part, but you know, the crew, the guys that are changing my tires and stuff, that's, that could be the O-lineman. And then the, you know, my spotters, the defense, the, like there, there's so many people that have to work together to make it successful. And another thing is it, it's the same when you fail, you know, if, if I don't have a good race, sometimes it's maybe because a lug nut came off or my tires off. Like my result shows 26, but my capabilities are so much more. Same when, you know, my husband, he can have a great game, but he, they could lose the game, but he, as a player did had a great game. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's so many variables in racing uh, coming down to, you know, the pit stops. If your crew chief's making the right decision, do you have a good spotter? Do you have chemistry with your team? Um, you know, is there a mechanical failure? Did someone run into you, push you into the wall and, you know, now your day is done. Like there's just so many variables that are outside your control as a driver. And that's why I think mindset's so important because, you know, focus on only the things you can tr control everything else, you know, it unfortunately just is what it is. You made me think of something like, you don't have to get into detail here, but so I know there's like boundaries, right. With like, you make the car fast or whatever, but there's stuff you can and can't do. Of course. It made me think of when I brought a baseball, like there was like the steroid steroid era, right. Where guys were taking steroids. Normally that ball, that would be an out right at the wall now is a home run. Next thing you know, a guy would hits 45 home runs you've never heard of and boom, makes more money and all that. What's like the equivalent in racing to like cheating that way? Is I mean, it like, like can you, can you get away with it even? Or do people no, like, you can no, yeah, you can never it. get away well, with it. Our right? cars go through inspection before every That's race, assume, after right? every race. So down to the spoiler height, the splitter height, the like everything has a certain measurement and that's why also when you see in the nascar cup series some guys will have to start in the rear because they failed tech okay yeah. one of their dimensions was off so it, you know do people try to cheat i'm sure but it's very easy to get caught so um for that reason it's just there's no re reason to really cheat you just kind of you, work on your stuff what if, what if have you seen limitless with bradley cooper yes yeah that's a, that's a real drug so it's like really yeah, I forget the name of it always, but it, like there's a drug it was based on. It's okay. like it's like it's like Adderall, but I think like times ten. Like okay. it's super like, um, it's like I 
you could probably take cognitive drugs <laughs> that <laughs> would be fine. You'd be like, oh, I, I have. Well, we do I get drug it. tested, so <laughs> you're not allowed to have Adderall or Ritalin or anything like that because we get drug tested for that. There you go, man. Yeah. I'm learning everything. Yeah, right. It's just like <laughs> the focus. I mean, I imagine that would help a lot, right? It's probably you why it's banned. Well, your, ne- your neck workout. <laughs> yeah. The reason I recognize your neck workout is I get an added for it on Facebook recently and Joe Rogan was talking about it. So he yeah. had it on and I was like, you could take some alpha brain, whatever he's selling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I gotta buy one of those. Uh, I think last question and then we can uh, get out of here. What, uh, sorry. And your dog was moving and because you have the blurry background now, it looked like a ghost, <laughs> Yeah, like a ghost, or like set, which was actually kind of cool. Um, <laughs> What is like a sponsorship cost? I was just kind of curious, like on a, you know, like the main sponsor on a car, like in the Arca series and then like even in the Cup series, like how much, how much are these, some of these brands shelling out to, to do that? So um, every sponsorship looks different with every race team at every series, but to give you an idea of what it costs to run a season um, for what I'm doing, it costs about a million to a million and a half. The truck series is probably about two to four, five million. Xfinity would be about three to eight million. And then the cup series about 15 to 30, 35 million. Damn. So yeah, we've had a, so, Bush, so Bush is showing out some serious coin for uh, Kevin Harvick in the four car. Yeah. <laughs> we've actually had a few emails. Well, as you've seen them, right? Like where people are like, I'd love for you to sponsor our car and stuff. They're like, it'd right. only cost. And it's like, I'm like, Jesus. Like, yeah. <laughs> right. I was like, uh, maybe, uh, maybe a little down the road, but maybe one race. <laughs> yeah. But Amber, this was a lot of fun. We'll be rooting for you. Uh, thanks Thank for taking you the time. And uh, Absolutely. we'll definitely send you more Bush stuff when you need it. Um, anytime you want a, a new shirt, tank, whatever, we'll take care of it. Yeah, we got you. Appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for having me on your show. Yep, no problem. Absolutely. See you, Amber. Thank Best you. Best of luck this season. Thank yeah, you, Yeah, good luck.